from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. The problems caused by not getting enough shut eye. We just become clutzier. Why it's a big problem on the farm and not just for adults. An update on efforts to find a growing bird flu outbreak across the country. So it does look like our producers are working really hard on their biosecurity. Markets react as peace talks progress between Russia and Ukraine. There's a lot of nervousness, Clinton, a lot of anxiety. Farmers in the region wage their own battle to plant a crop. An update right now on Ag Day. Good morning. I'm Clinton Griffiths. We're following two developing stories today. High fire danger in the plains and markets moving downward amid renewed hopes of a ceasefire between Russia and Ukraine. And we begin with a war and Russia's military announcing it will fundamentally cut back operations near Ukraine's capital and a northern city. Ukraine's military said it had noted withdrawals around Kyiv and Chernihiv. But the war continues and a second war is happening in the farmland of Ukraine. Farmers are working not just to feed their country, but the world. A company that monitors ag in the region saying right now, farmers in the country are planting 15 to 20 percent of the area they planned for spring crops. They say they're still having trouble accessing diesel fuel for their farms as the military forces get priority for fuel supplies. They also say seeds are available while fertilizer supplies are worse. Now, for markets here at home, there's a lot of nervousness on the part of investors. People are holding large positions because they have an opinion that we're at war and the Ukraine crop is uh, potentially trying to be planted, trying to be fertilized on that wheat that was planted last fall. There's a lot of people missing from Ukraine. So logistically, uh, no one quite knows. We don't have the boots on the ground like we used to, and really no one wants to be there and cover the story uh, to run around. But when you look at Ukraine and you look how important it is to the world market, uh, we, we had a big down day today. You saw crude sell off. You saw the stock market go up. You've seen the grain markets trade limit down in both wheat and corn. But that doesn't mean this is resolved. That doesn't mean any corn acres are getting planted. But Tommy says USDA's prospective plantings report could be one of the largest numbers in history for the markets. And we will certainly bring you those numbers as soon as they're released at noon tomorrow. So look for team coverage on that. Something else we're tracking right now, the threat of wildfires is continuing to grow in the Southern Plains and Gulf Coast. Now this fire is one of the big ones right now in Central Texas, the Crittenburg Complex Fire. It has burned more than 33,000 acres near Fort Hood. It's about 55% contained. Now it's made up of three separate fires that burn together. Authorities believe it was likely sparked by munitions training near Fort Hood Army Base. While that typically wouldn't spark a blaze, extreme drought conditions in the area made it more susceptible. Right now, there are 13 active wildfires burning in Texas alone, but more fires are burning in other states, including Colorado. Meteorologist Matt Urasavik is here. And Matt, those extremely dry conditions, higher temperatures mixed with high winds are not good news. Yeah, all those uh, combinations there really uh, signifying that dry ground and the fire potential that we've got. And we see that again today, especially across southern Texas, up into southern parts of New Mexico. And then again, really from the Ohio Valley, parts of Indiana, all the way through Kentucky, towards Tennessee and down into central Georgia as well. We'll see more rain in this neck of the woods, but right now we've got dry uh, conditions out there ahead of this storm system. So here's a look at the storm as we head through the day on Wednesday. You're really going to see this squall line here start to uh, really produce a lot of what could be a severe weather outbreak across parts of Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana, even over into Alabama. And then that's going to be moving to the east as we head through the day on Thursday, severe weather moving towards the east coast. For today, though, severe weather outbreak is likely. We've got that tornado threat mainly being inside of this orange area, whereas the red area signifies the uh, really the chance for damaging wind gusts, flooding rains, and even some small hail likely. We'll talk more about this coming up in just a little bit. Lawmakers are releasing an updated version of the Cattle Price Discovery and Transparency Act. Now, under the new plan, there would still be a requirement for minimum purchase levels by packers, which was a key area of concern 
among many in the cattle industry. Republican Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa, among those involved in the legislation, he says lawmakers worked for months with USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack and also with the Senate Ag Committee on these changes. We heard from stakeholders who wanted to make sure that all big four packing plants would be covered because evidently the way that the bill was written, there could be some of these big four in parts of the country that weren't covered by part of it. Uh, now it does not matter where the plant is located. Uh, if you're one of the big four, you will be required to provide price transparency to the market. The revised bill would establish five to seven regions where minimum levels of fed cattle buys must be made through approved pricing mechanisms. Violations of the regulation would result in a maximum penalty of $90,000 for big packers. The bill would also create a publicly available library of marketing contracts. Every day it seems to bring new reports of a deadly bird flu with highly pathogenic avian influenza cases now confirmed in 45 commercial operations in 32 backyard flocks. That includes a second case confirmed in Butler County, Nebraska, in a flock of 417,000 commercial broilers. It also continues its spread in South Dakota. The most recent case, a commercial turkey flock in Gerald County. That flock included 45,000 turkeys. Earlier this week, two poultry flocks in Minnesota were impacted, including 300,000 turkeys in Meeker County and 17 chickens, ducks, and geese in a backyard flock in Mauer County. But experts say there is a bit of good news here. The outbreak has so far not affected as many birds as it did back in 2015. They also say more of the cases this time are coming from direct contact with wild birds. Rather than spread between domestic flocks, so it does look like our producers are working really hard on their biosecurity. It does look like this virus is very prevalent in the environment, in the wild birds, and so even people with excellent biosecurity could be challenged. Sifford says producers have been doing a good job of reporting sick birds and says that has led to faster quarantine and depopulation which are keys to controlling the spread of the virus. Lots of newer cars can run on E85, and in California, more consumers are choosing the ethanol-laden fuel over standard gasoline. According to new data from the California Air Resources Board, sales of E85 surged to a new record in 2021, up 55% last year, and have nearly doubled since 2018. Golden State drivers bought some 62.5 million gallons. The volume is expected to be even higher in 2022 as E10 gasoline prices continue at record highs. Now, one station group says E85 sales were up another 20% from January to February just this year. Over the past few weeks, E85 has seen prices 30 to 50% below gasoline. The Renewable Fuels Association says it's safe to assume that California now leads the nation in consumption of flex fuels. And it looks like more U.S. fuel is heading overseas. Bloomberg reporting that U.S. diesel exports have surged. It says buyers in Europe and Latin America are working to secure supplies that have tightened since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Diesel exports out of the U.S. Gulf Coast have reportedly climbed to more than a million barrels per day so far this month on track to hit the highest level since August of 2019. The overseas pull on diesel is straining U.S. stockpiles, which fell to their lowest level in eight years seasonally. We're getting ready for tomorrow's big report with USDA. Up next, we talk with Tommy Grisafi about why this report is such a big deal. And later, something else that's a big deal we often take for granted, getting enough sleep. Why it can be such an issue on the farm. Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator, it's not just any closing wheel. Reach your yield potential. Pre-order by March 31st with coupon code AGDAY for $2 shipping per wheel. We caught up with Tommy Grisafi with Advanced Trading today. Tommy, as we kind of wait for the big report to come out from USDA on Thursday, we've had a lot of acreage estimates come out already. What's your take uh, as we get ready to get this report? It seems like it could be a big, big important number. <laughs> Every day is a big important day, and it's a, it's a interesting world we live in, Clinton. So talking about the report, it's a big deal, and here's why. As I sit here today in Fargo, North Dakota, 
I can't figure out where these corn acres are going to come from. Now, if they magically show up, that'll be interesting. But as I sit here and talk to my clients in the Northern Plains, Minnesota, and then clients in Texas, look at the price of cotton. Look at the price of canola. Look at the price of barley, wheat, edibles, peas. Heck, someone from the government was saying we should all be eating lentils. I imagine people have to plant those too. Where are the corn acres going to come from? And if you weren't prepared to plant corn as the market breaks now here the last few days, as fertilizer and other inputs hit record highs, assuming you can get them, where's the corn acres going to come from? So could we see a bearish number? Possibly, but we still have to get that crop planted. We don't have a corn crop planted yet. It's cold in the Midwest and upper Midwest. Supplies are tight and it is expensive to plant corn. So watch that corn bean ratio. Of course, we have a huge report coming out, but every day is a huge big day. We go limit up, limit down on which way the wind's blowing in the latest tweet out of Ukraine. End of the month, end of the quarter, there's a war going on. Expect volatility, my friend. As we kind of get this number, what are the, the, the main thing that you're going to digest here? And, and how long will the market trade it? Well, that's a great point. Well, I'm glad the number's on a Thursday, not on a Friday. So we'll digest the number and we'll open again Thursday night and trade all day Friday. People get a chance to digest the number. A couple interesting things. When you look at the range of how many acres analysts have, uh, how many acres of soybeans could be planted that's a very wide range and corn's a, a wide range too and every million acres matters here and so when you look at corn wheat beans and all the other crops you can plant the the biggest question is how many total acres will be planted and and did we see any switching now from the clients i talked to clinton even though prices are moving aggressively every day they're not changing their rotation so much because what's done is done so if they had fertilizer put down in the fall and prepaid, they're totally happy about it. If they were not organized, if they weren't prepared, if they didn't believe that they should go buy their inputs last fall or didn't, now it, it, it doesn't look that great to go plant corn all of a sudden as the market's dropped the last few days, my friend. Yeah, it's an interesting time. We'll be taking a look at that number when it comes out. Always appreciate the insights, Tommy. Thank you for being Thank here. You. We'll be back with more Ag Day coming up in just a minute. Interested in spending a day with a trader? Call Tommy Grisafi at 800-664-4383. The 2022 Bracket Busters Challenge, presented by Case IH, is underway. Who's still in the game? To find out, head to AgWeb now through April 4th to check the leaderboard. Ag Day Weather is brought to you by Zoetis. Even though calves don't wait for perfect weather to arrive, you can count on Zoetis to be there. Share a picture of your newest calf and you could win a calving season survival kit. Enter now at calvingseason.com. Peter Aldrich, Matt Yurisovic joining us here, taking a look at the severe weather threat that we have. And, and Matt, this is a pretty big part of the South. Oh yeah, we've seen that storm system move out of the Rockies and now we've got a decent amount of the South and the Gulf Coast under what could be a severe weather outbreak later on today. And when we talk about a severe weather outbreak, we're talking about gusty winds, the chance for hail and the potential for tornadoes as well. And you can see this area highlighted in red. This is where we're talking about the best chance for those conditions and the best chance for some tornadoes as well. So if you're in that red area, that's where you really need to be paying attention. Be weather aware today, even outside of that red area, Atlanta, St. Louis, back to Houston, still need to be paying attention to the weather. Be weather aware. Keep your eye on the sky as we head through today. That line of storms going to be moving from west to east and then that severe weather threat will slide towards the east coast as we head through the day on Wednesday. You don't see any red here, but still a large area all the way from upstate New York down through Florida, where we could be looking at the chance for severe storms. So here's a look at what the map looks like. We've got snow to the north, the colder air coming in on the backside. First low coming up through the Midwest and another one forming down uh, really across parts of Oklahoma on Wednesday morning. Then as this system gets going, this is where we start to see that line of severe weather right in here start to move eastward and that continues through the evening on Wednesday. Could even be looking at some late night 
quite severe storms across parts of uh, really Alabama and Georgia, even Tennessee. Then that threat for severe storms moves toward the east coast heading through the day on Thursday and then eventually off the coast by Friday morning. High pressure moving into uh, into place and will be mostly quiet through the lower 48. But over the next couple of days, a lot of rain falling with this storm system and it's going to be one to two plus inches of rain and that's really from parts of Oklahoma on to the east all the way through to the east coast and temperatures out ahead of this storm system going to be very very warm 70s even closer to 80 in parts of the south and east but then much cooler air coming in on the back side of that system with even a few flakes in the midwest and parts of the great lakes that's a look around the country now let's take a look at the weather where you live Mio, Michigan, wintry mix early with afternoon rain, a high of 46 degrees. Oak Grove, Louisiana, warm and windy with severe storms likely, a high of 77. And Watertown, South Dakota, periods of snow, a high of 31. Ag Day is brought to you by Authority Supreme Herbicide from FMC. Learn more at ag.fmc.com. It may look pretty while it's growing, like baby's breath, but it can cause a lot of problems on the farm, especially in pastures. Ann Pierce of the Wisconsin First Detector Network helps us identify smooth bed straw in this week's Weed Wednesday. Hello, I'm Ann Pierce with the Wisconsin First Detector Network at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Today we're going to take a look at an invasive plant called smooth bed straw. It's also known as white bed straw or false baby's breath and it's a restricted invasive species in Wisconsin. Smooth bed straw has been a problematic weed in pastures in the northeastern United States. Here in Wisconsin though, we've primarily seen it growing along roadsides and along woodland edges. So smooth bed straw grows about one to three feet tall. It's a perennial species and its stems are square and smooth. And so that sets it apart from many of the bed straws that have rough stems. The leaves of smooth bed straw come in whorls of six to eight. So the whorls stack along the stem um, and the leaves are also smooth, don't have hairs on them, which is again, one characteristic that sets it apart from many other of the bed straws. Another key characteristic of our smooth bed straw is that it has relatively large clusters of flowers. And the flowers are small, white flowers with four petals and then the flowers develop into tiny fruits only about a millimeter long and the fruits have a... so looking at smooth bed straw the key characteristics are the smooth hairless stem and leaves the large clusters of white flowers and then the leaves uh, are in groups of six to eight in each whorl for more information about smooth bed straw, you can visit the Wisconsin First Detector Network website. And while smooth bed straw may sound like something that could help you get a good night's sleep, it appears many people aren't. How not getting enough shut eye could cause problems on the farm and what to do about it in the country. Closed captioning on Ag Day is brought to you by BASF, helping you do the biggest job on earth. As you get up and start your day, some food for thought. Up to a third of Americans are not getting enough sleep. The Centers for Disease Control says it's a national health problem, and some experts are even calling it another pandemic. And it's a particularly hazardous one on the farm. Susan Harris is a nurse and sleep expert with the University of Nebraska Extension Service. She has spent much of her career studying sleep and advising people, especially farmers and farm workers. She says sleep deprivation produces the same effects in the body as being drunk. Difficulty concentrating, we just become klutzier, we make poor decisions, which becomes a huge problem on farm and ranch properties because we know how dangerous farming and ranching is anyway. And then to add to it, this fatigue factor becomes life threatening. But it's not just an issue for adults on the farm. Studies show teens and kids actually need more than nine hours of sleep to function well but almost 70% of high school students surveyed report sleeping only seven hours or less a night. And that can be a problem for kids and teens who work on the farm. Adolescents on farms are two to three times more likely to be injured if they get less than nine hours and 15 minutes per night. So truly they should have 
at least nine to 10 hours. Now, Susan says to make sure you get enough sleep, get up at the same time every day to help control your own internal body clock. And she says, while most people think you need to be warm to go to sleep, your body actually has to cool down. So turn the temperature down a bit in your room at night. And light is very important. Take in sunshine during the day and lower the lights in the evening. There you have it, great advice. And that's gonna wrap us up for today's edition of Ag Day. From all of us here, I'm Clint Griffiths. Have a great day out in farm country.